Welcome to the Short Term Show, the show about short term rentals and long term wealth, with real property owners hosting real properties who are crushing it in the vacation and short term rental space. And here's your host, Avery Carl. Did you know that we're officially back in a buyer's market? That's right. Even though interest rates continue to rise, they are causing prices to fall. So there's finally room for you to do regular real estate investor things that we couldn't do for so long, like gas, negotiate, make lower offers, ask for sellers to cover some of your closing costs. So it's a really great time to buy in terms of being able to get a lower purchase price and being able to negotiate. So if you're looking for your first or next short-term rental, it's a perfect time to reach out to us at the short-term shop. Let our team of agents in any of our true vacation market destinations help you find the perfect investment. Jump on over to the shorttermshop.com and click get connected to get started. We are brokered by eXp Realty. See y'all over there. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Short Term Show. Today we have a good friend of mine who I've known for five or six years now and never had on the show. And I'm not entirely sure why other than like my own laziness and overwhelm and just uh, not paying attention to what I'm doing. But we're finally getting her on. Her name is Erica Muller. She's got a super cool company called Vrolio and I'll let her introduce herself and Vrolio from here. So, hey, Erica, how's it going? Hey, thank you so much for having me on. It has definitely been a while and love watching all the growth you guys are having. Um, so my name's Erica. I started selling short-term rentals as an agent back in 2007. Um, I got licensed in 2001. So I've been in real estate over 22 years. My background is in commercial real estate. Um, and then got into short-term rentals with that. So kind of mixed those two together. And then I stepped out of selling short-term rentals um, about four years ago to build technology, became a data scientist, wanted to build better data solutions. As an investor myself, I understood the pain points that a lot of you guys have as investors. Um, as an agent, I understood the pain points that we have as agents. Um, so my goal with Rolio was really to kind of just solve that for both parties and bring better products to the market that... Um, you know, people can can use and work together from as the agent and the um as and the investor have a better relationship with tools. Okay. So you've got a data company. Let's talk about what those tools are that you just mentioned. What do they do? How are they different from other data tools on the market? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of data tools out there. Um, and in my opinion, everything stays pretty high level. And when you start getting into predicting returns, stuff like that, it it gets it gets a little scary because you want to really know like what are they what kind of data are they using to predict these returns how clean is the data um one of the things i like to talk about and if it's too boring avery just cut me off like i'm good with that uh, no. but it's data data quality right and so i think a lot of the data tools on the market and i'm not i'm not singling anyone out it's just kind of a thing is that they just really scrape a couple of otas throw it on a map there's not a really um intense sanitation or cleaning process with that data so you're getting a lot of um, you're getting a lot of comparables and properties in those data sets that shouldn't be there. Like we would never use those in a real estate transaction if we were underwriting that as the lender. Um, if we were the, the appraiser, we would never use those comps. Um, so we would throw them out. But what happens is on these bigger data sites, um, it's all in the data set. So you'll have one uh, comparable bringing down the rates of of a good comparable. Um, then you have some bringing the rates up. So. The big difference with what we do is we go through a very intensive, very labor intensive cleansing process of data. So we work with a smaller data set, but it's a cleaner data set. We start with the same size data set as everyone else, but after we identify what shouldn't be there, we take it out because ours, our data is meant to be used by professionals, um, B2B, so realtors, mortgage brokers, appraisers. Um, funds. And so there's a different standard when you get into the enterprise category than there is just consumer facing products that are sold one at a time. Um, so that's kind well, of a standard issue. Let's talk about that. So what kinds of things should not be in there that we're removing? What, what does that yeah. mean? So let's talk about how if we were going to appraise a property and we were appraising it using income, for example, an appraiser would go out and they would only use comps that have a trailing 12 to start with. So they wouldn't look at the rental next door that just got leased out two days ago or a week ago. Um, that would be thrown out. It would never be used. 
when we're looking at the the comps on the off the OTAs or off many data sites, there's a lot of properties on there that don't have a trailing 12. They don't have a full year of performance to show how they actually perform over the course of a year. Some of them came on to the OTA during the best time of the year, the, the biggest season of the year, and it makes their average nightly rate much higher because it looks like they that's what their average nightly rate is, but it's just a good season, right? So you really need that one-year cycle in order to show, hey, this is actually how this home is going to perform in every time, at every time of the year. So we get rid of all that stuff that doesn't have a trailing 12. Once it does, we put it into our data set, but it has to earn its way into our data set and prove to us um, that it's a valuable piece of data for one. Um, and then we have things like a lot of people will put a property on an OTA and they'll have their uncle write a review for them, like pretend like they stay there, um, their uncle, their cousin, their sister, and they'll have like two reviews or a review from their family member and they're all five stars. And it looks like it was a really well-performing property, but it's just not. Um, so we look at how many reviews these properties have as well, and we validate that. Um, and so we'll throw things out that only has like one review or even two reviews, but they're probably like um, related to the owner in some way. Like we try to like dig into that. We have to use AI for some of this. And in other cases, we, you know, we have an algorithm, but so we, that's, I, can, I don't want to go into the weeds, but there's a lot of things like that. So when when you imagine that you start off with, let's just use a number like 100 million pieces of data, when you're done with all of these steps, you're really down to like 50 million pieces of data. And that's a big difference. And it really changes the way that the end result looks. Yeah, I would imagine it does, yeah. <laughs> cutting out that much bad data. And I mean, who knows how many times it, when you're looking at, at this data that hasn't hasn't been cleaned this way, there are probably are a lot of those outliers that you mentioned of, or not necessarily an outlier because they, these pieces that are not full pictures. So if somebody has only been listed for like a month and it's the high season, or conversely, if somebody has only been listed for a month and it's the super low season, that can really, really change the way the data looks and make you potentially make a wrong decision because all of that's included in there. Yeah. And two, we look at standardization. Like if as an agent, when we go into our MLS um, and we pull information from the MLS, we have to separate it by a single family or a condo or a townhouse. We don't have it all combined. So in order to really like match up OTA data with really great real estate data, we have to go through the same process. So we can't just take condos and townhouses and single family and throw them all into one category because they all have two bedrooms. They're the same. Um, that's also a big issue where we go to a we go through a really you know um, intense process of having to segment all that out and only put things in the right category because that two bedroom condo could totally bring down the rate of that two bedroom house and that two bedroom house is going to bring the rate of that condo up so you've got to like clean all that out and separate it and segment it. I I totally agree with that because in some markets there are single families that are studios or one bedrooms and I know that's not common in a lot of places but for example I own several in the Smokies that are studios and if you're looking at the wrong data you might just assume like in a beach market, like in Panama City or Destin, one bedrooms and studios are always going to be condos. Mm -hmm. One bedroom and studio single families do not exist. And in different markets, it's going to be different. In the Smokies, I don't want to say there's a lot of studios, but I own a studio. There's people on my team that own several. So they exist in a much larger capacity than in other markets. So I, I think that is an important distinction to make between the condo and the single family and the townhome because they do earn differently. Oh yeah. And they all, they all, um, behave differently in different markets. So, so yeah, those are the kind of things that just needed to be done. Right. And, and the, the way we approach it and we feel like professionals too, that use our data, they have to be held to a higher standard. Um, and that's what we have to deliver on is that professionals are the ones that are actually at the end of the day, helping make these decisions for the investor. So the, their their advice and their guidance is only going to be as good too as the data they use. So we feel like and 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 not to discount their local knowledge, we're going to talk about that because there's a lot of valuable local knowledge they have. But imagine how valuable that becomes when that's paired with even better data, right? So these professionals are now like superheroes in the industry when they have tools like this. Yeah, and I, there's definitely. I want to dive into that in a minute, but first I want to talk about like why you need that quantitative data as well as qualitative analysis to figure out where 
how a property should perform. So you you want to have that really good data to give you that range of, okay, I'm looking at four bedrooms. This is where about they perform. But you want to use that qualitative, we call it the enemy method around here, is, is basically just looking at other people's listings that are the top performers and seeing what they have and what what the architecture is, what the decor is to make sure that you are buying the thing that's going to be a top performer. So where I see people get in trouble is I call it shopping in the bargain bin. And it's really hard to, as a real estate agent, when somebody's found like a super cheap four bedroom, and we'll stick to the Smokies as an example, because I already used it. Uh, It's really difficult to, for for people to not feel like every real estate agent is just trying to make a sale or make a higher sale, but they need to be able to see. So for example, in the Smokies, you can get a four bedroom mid 2000s brick ranch home for significantly cheaper than a four bedroom cabin. But you have to go look at the top performers and look at all everything about them, not just the architecture, not just the decor, not just the amenities, but the quality of the listing. Are the photos good? Are they dark? Does it look like somebody took them with their flip phone 20 years ago? All of those things make a difference in how a property is going to perform. So you can go look and very clearly see that the top performers in that market are cabins or cabin style properties. They are not brick ranch homes from the 2000s that you could pick up and put in any city in the world and it would feel like it belongs there. So I think that that's really important to distinguish. Like you you need that data, but you also have to be able to take a qualitative look at things using the enemy method and say, and find out, okay, this is the type of property, the aesthetically type of property, amenities, decor, et cetera, that will get me to this number. Oh yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. And, and, on, and to kind of like build on that, um, you also need to know like the mark, like the areas of where to look for those. So for example, you're saying that the cabins in the Blue Ridge and the Smokies, well, not all Blue Ridge cabins in the Smokies are, are not Blue Ridge and the Smokies. I'm talking <laughs> about two different markets, <laughs> uh, but not all the cabins in the Smokies are going to even be the same. So it could be a right. cabin, but we need to make sure we're focusing on just the top performing cabins. And so we need to know how to do that easily. And so there's like this kind of like this vortex where it can really get granular if we keep digging into it, but absolutely right. And that's where the expert on the ground comes in. And 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 we would have never known that, Avery, if you didn't just as an expert in that market, share that. If we only use data and we made every decision just on data, we would have missed that super important piece of information and probably just bought that brick house. Right. So I feel like the data can get you 60 to 70 percent of the way there, but it's not going to get you all the way if you're not working with the right person behind it. I, I totally agree with that. And obviously, because I'm a real estate agent, but I think, I think I'll just address that before somebody comments it. Um, so you and I were talking the other day about the big, the big like property management company or big publication list of best places to buy vacation rentals that comes out every year and how those can be dangerous if you use them as a guide without other context, like what we're talking about with the data and the uh, the local experts. So um, can you kind of, let's, I want to hear your perspective on why those lists can be dangerous if you're just looking at, oh, well, you know what? This company said that these are the top five places to invest in vacation rentals. So I'm going to go buy one there. And then I think a lot of people do that without digging in really any further. Uh, for example, uh, there's there's twice uh, in the past year, Starkville, Mississippi, where I grew up, has been on two different lists for best places to buy a vacation home. Um, now I do own a vacation home in Starkville, Mississippi, so that we don't have to, it was right next door to my parents so that we can get our own space when we go there for Christmas and, and things like that. And it was super cheap, by the way. Um, so there's not, there's one type of, of tourist, maybe two that goes to Starkville. It is Mississippi state fans, fans of the worst team in the entire sec. And then the college, uh, traveler. So people dropping their kids off at college or maybe traveling, uh, professors or grad students, et cetera, who may, who are maybe there doing research for a few months. Um, it's a very like agricultural school. So that like, I don't think that Starkville should be on the same list as like a Joshua tree, but they are, and there's no context as to why. So anyway, I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about this. So, okay. I have a lot to say, and I'm just, (laughs) I'm going to start by saying, I absolutely hate those lists. And there's a reason we don't put them out. Um, and I'll tell you why is because Every year, it seems like there's a race to the finish line for somebody to get that list out first. 
And then everybody puts one out, the best markets to invest in. Everyone's got their opinions. And some some markets you'll see on multiple lists, some markets you'll, you know, everyone's got their own unique take on it. I never, I never want to even look at those because here there's two different things going on here. There's markets with good potential in terms of overall ROI across the market on average, but then there's the right market for you to invest in based on your buying power. So let's use um, the um, the panhandle of Florida, for example, Destin. Destin, um, that area, you know it really well. You have properties mm -hmm. there. That's a great market for a certain type of buyer in a certain price point with a certain budget. Um, and, and I do believe there's opportunity in every market if you're working with the right agent, but the most likely opportunity there is not going to be for, you know, an entry level person that has $200,000 to invest. They're going to struggle to find something in that market. However, there might be a middle of nowhere market somewhere, but just happens to have things going on um, and enough tourism to support opportunities that is better for them. And they're actually going to do better. And that wasn't on the list. And this isn't even on their radar. Um, so one of the reasons I do hate those lists is because they're very generalized and they make the assumption that everybody's scenario and their buying scenario is exactly the same. I think that's another reason why, too, Avery, you guys love to use cash on cash return because it is a personalized metric to each investor. They can look at um, the two investors can look at the same product and both have a different cash on cash return. And that's how it is with these markets is two people can go to the same market but maybe one of them is going to be successful and one isn't. So I wouldn't want to be the one putting those lists out there. Um, I think it should be more catered towards um, if you were going to invest up to 500000 and you had 20% down, um, you could possibly look at this market and this type of product. Uh, it would have to be really granular for me to, to even want to even look at it. So that's how I feel about those, um, you know, on the short, the short version. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, I totally agree with that. And I think that it it does encourage, of course, it's up to every investor to do their own due diligence and the level at which they choose to do that is on them. But, you know, back to the Starkville thing. So you would think, okay, Starkville, Mississippi, nobody wants to go to Mississippi. It's like a very like niche place to want to go. And you would think the real estate there is super cheap, but it's actually not. A three-bedroom condo in Starkville, Mississippi is $900,000. So you might think because it's on this list, like, oh, well, it says it's a great place to invest. This thing must make money. And it's potentially possible that it could, but I, there is just not enough tourism going to this small town of 25, 30,000 people to support being able to buy in at that purchase price because Exactly. The area that it needs to be in in order to capitalize on any sort of college tourism is very expensive. And like you could buy a three bedroom condo in Panama City Beach, make a lot more money, have a much longer season for less than that. So I just there's I mean, I, I could give any number of of examples. And and another thing that I wanted to touch on too with with data companies that I would love for you to kind of shed some light on it, how how our listeners can avoid making this mistake. Um, there's two markets in particular where I see this. I see it on lists all the time and I see it uh, kind of, I see it segmented on different data companies or management companies' websites as all being the same when it isn't. And I did not do a good job of explaining that, but it'll make more sense as I go on. So two examples, uh, Fort Walton Beach, Florida and Navarre, Florida. So both of those areas, they're right here on the Emerald Coast, right next door to me, uh, mm -hmm. right next to Destin actually. And both of those areas are areas that have a bay and then the beach houses and the condos and the places that people come to vacation are out on the barrier island. So Navarre Beach is different than Navarre. Fort Walton Beach, it's all called Fort Walton Beach, but it's actually Okaloosa Island where all of the uh, the vacation rentals are. And so what I see people doing who, who've never been here, they look at these bays and they they think, oh, that's the beach, but it's not. The barrier island is the beach. The bay is the bay. It's muddy. It's There's not a beach there. But people think, oh, it's on the water. 
that's where I want to buy. Properties, again, are significantly cheaper on the bay side, but the tourists do not go there. The tourists will rent a porta john on the beach before they go to the bay side to rent something. So I, I see people get in a lot of trouble. I actually had like a full on argument with an investor a few years ago who insisted he was looking at uh, Fort Walton Beach. I'll give it a little more credit. Not just a tourist town, also a big military town. So he was looking at, again, a brick. It's always brick ranch homes that that end up being the thing that people don't want to rent in these areas. Um, he was using the Okaloosa Island. So the vacation rental area that has a really high income numbers that has not been differentiated from Fort Walton Beach as a whole. They're just calling it Fort Walton, Florida or Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Way on the other side of the bay. He's like, oh, well, you know what? It's it's a 15 minute drive to the beach. People will still do that. In some markets like Sarasota, they might. But in this market, they don't. They walk to the beach. So significantly cheaper property, 15 minute drive to the beach on the wrong side of the bay. And I'm having to argue with this person why it's not going to do the numbers that the the Okaloosa Island properties will do because the tourists don't go there. So what are some ways that investors can do some research or what are some best practices in terms of due diligence and data when they're looking at markets like this? Because Navarre, same thing. People buy on the wrong side of the bay. People don't go there. You want Navarre Beach. But a lot of these lists and companies, they don't differentiate that Fort Walton proper is a completely different market than Okaloosa Island. And they just go, oh, it's Fort Walton address. I'm going to buy there. Oh, it's a Navarre address. I'm going to buy there, even if it's on the wrong side. So uh, I've seen several people make this mistake and come to us to and say, hey, oh, my property is not, not making money. Can you help me? I'm like, oh, th- th- there's nothing I, ne- I want to say less to an investor than, oh, you bought the wrong house. Yeah. And so how can we avoid that? I feel like I went way off on a tangent there. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the content of our podcast, but you have additional short-term rental questions, we host a weekly live question session that you guys can join for free. It's at 1 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays. And if you head over to strquestions.com, you can sign up. So not only am I the host of this show, but I also own and manage my own properties. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about short-term rental investing. So please join us anytime for a free weekly live Q&A on Zoom. Sign up at strquestions.com. Sell with the short-term shop. Are you looking to sell your short-term rental or even 1031 into a different property? Our team of realtors will work hard to get you the most for your investment. We are experts in our field and would love to earn your business. When it's time to sell, call the shop, theshorttermshop.com. That's theshorttermshop.com. Brokered by EXP. No, no, it's really good stuff because I dealt with that too when I was um, selling properties in Kissimmee. I had the same exact problem. We our Fort uh, Walton Bay was basically Davenport. And at the time you needed to be very close to Disney. I understand we had the same situation. I feel like there's a case like that for every market. Um, so one, I just need people to understand that there's no possible way that a data company is going to understand that kind of a fact. It's not a data point that you can pull from the OTAs unless, and there are ways to do it, um, unless you're looking at, um, you know, review data, things like that. And I don't see people doing that yet. I know we're working on it. Um, and on the back end, we, we use that. But you really have to be looking at those kind of conversations that are happening in the reviews. So if you're, and this is kind of like outside of data, if you're asking what a person can do outside of data before even calling a real estate agent, because my answer to that would mm-hmm. be like, they really need to be getting on a phone with a local expert. And then second, they need to know if they're talking to an expert and not a pretender, like an imposter is what I meant to say. Because it's also easy to to think someone knows what they're talking about and then they're going to sell you that underperforming house. Um, But what I would do is if I saw that in the data, um, I would go onto that area on Airbnb and I would start reading every single review on all of those properties to see if somebody's talking about, uh, especially the low review, the ones with lower reviews, to see what people are saying. Like, are they saying things like, oh, it was just too far, you know, great house, but had to rent a car, Get it was really far to get to the beach or those things are in the reviews. Like before we had access to all this data as an agent in 2007, when there was no Airbnb, that's the kind of stuff I had to do like on HomeAway, when, back when HomeAway was a thing. <laughs> I actually had to read every single review 
to find out what the heck was actually going on in these neighborhoods. And it wasn't easy and it is time consuming. A faster way to do that is just pick up the phone and call the agent, but not go buy that property just because in the data, it looks like it's in a good area or the the data report said that this whole market is great because you're absolutely right. Those markets, um, there's micro markets within the market. And so that's really hard for the data to pull out without that um, intimate knowledge of being on the ground. Um, so that would be like my solution if that's something that someone had to do on their own, um, just using data is like, read those reviews because that information's in there. For example, on that same area, there is even if you read reviews one time, I discovered that somebody was complaining about the fact, and this is more of a strategy thing than just location, but they were complaining about the fact that they rented one of these properties right on the beach and they didn't provide beach chairs. And so they'll never rent it again because other houses were providing that. What is like, and they got a bad review because of that. Like there are so many things that we can learn from reviews um, if we actually read them as investors, but data companies, they're not doing that. Right. And, and they're not providing you that they're looking at numbers and even us, I feel like we have the most advanced data in the industry and we are working on those solutions. But like even right now, the reason why we don't sell this data directly to the investor is because we know this. We know that our data is going to get them 70 percent of the way there, but we're not going to be able to get them 100 percent without the agent. So our customer is the agent because we want you to work with that agent um, to put those pieces together. And that's really what you have to know when you're looking at these things is there is pieces of information that you're not getting. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And as much as I would like to say like a local, a great agent is the answer to everything as an agent. Like before you ever call an agent, you've got to look really hard at the data. Don't just say, oh, Fort Walton Beach. Great. I found a cheap house in Fort Walton Beach. This is cute. Let's do it. Uh, So you got the data enemy method, like you talked about looking at all the reviews of everything, looking at what they say, beach chairs. I mean, that's a prime like enemy method thing to find uh, around here. Like we provide beach chairs in all of our properties. And if you are like, if you're buying a property in Destin and you're four bedroom, you're going to be enemy methoding my house. Mm -hmm. And we have, we provide beach chairs. We provide a beach wagon. And you kind of have to do that when it's public beach access or you have to provide them, but you also have to give them the the information for the rentals. So uh, always looking at the reviews, the reviews of both high performing and low performing properties to see what the common themes are. So if all the high performing properties get mentioned proximity to the beach, well, you know, you need to be closer to the beach in order to do that. Uh, If all of the lower performing properties have reviews that mention proximity to the beach in the opposite direction. Okay. Well, we're not going to do that. Um, and I'm trying to think what else I also want to caution you guys to be careful of like trying to prove the data wrong. Well, watch this. I'm going to have the best property way too far from the beach and I'm going to do just as well because it's easy to get caught up in like, well, you know, I can't afford close to the beach, but this property 20 minutes away, it's kind of a tertiary market. Let's do this. And you can kind of get yourself in trouble. Don't, don't try to out outdo the data. Try to work, do find in the data and in the enemy method, what corresponds with the highest performers and do that. Don't try to be the best of the lowest performing area because that's not a good way to go. Yeah, no. And that's what we tell people all the time is like the first place we start when we're teaching investors and agents and everyone how to like analyze the data is like, first, just look at where your high performers are, because you're going to learn a lot just from seeing where all the high performers are. Um, right away. And so like, if you, if you're just looking at prices first of how much you can afford to buy, that's not, that's not the first step. A lot of people will go on Zillow and they'll start their search. Like they'll hear about this market and say, and they'll say, it's a really great market. Then they'll go to Zillow and they'll look at what fits their buy box as far as price goes. And that, and that's the area that they focus on buying. And that's a horrible decision. Like you said, like the best solution you can do there is if you can't afford um, a property in that market. And I don't mean it in a bad way. Like everybody has a budget. I have a budget. We all have one. If your budget doesn't allow for the top performing type of product in that market, just pick a different market, right? It's like pick a different market. There's, There's like thousands of them across the country where you can make money. If you don't have an emotional reason for buying there, um, then just pick a different market. That's it. If you have yeah. an emotional reason for buying there, then just understand you might lose money. Like those are really the only two conversations to be had right there. Um, and so if you're starting your search off with, by trying to force a square peg into a round hole, you're probably just going to be underwhelmed with your returns and just mad at somebody else um, for a problem that you created to begin with. I 
that was very profound. I, and I think a lot of people were like, oh, my budget's not that high. And they get like, have this emotional, like embarrassment thing. But guys, like, I mean, I bought 20 houses in Chattanooga, Tennessee before I got priced out of it. It is nothing Mm -hmm. to be embarrassed of or feel any kind of way emotionally. It's just a numbers thing. The prices in Chattanooga got too high for me to make sense of. So I moved to a different market. It's that's what everybody does. I think that's what all professional real estate investors do. They don't, it markets change, they can grow and they can get more expensive. And when they start to do that, just pivot to another one. And there's no, there's no shame in that. You don't have to keep like, I'm only buying in this market forever. Uh, you know, for example, Destin's too expensive, scoot over to Forgotten Coast. I've got one there too on Cape Sandblast. I paid about half what my Destin property would have been at the time. And I'm one, not even a block. There's no, there's no roads between me and the beach. There's just one house in front of me. And we've got great views with the exception of this one house. Um, or, you know, Myrtle Beach, North Carolina. I mean, South Carolina uh, is the, I think, the cheapest, most affordable numbers working, like income producing beachfront property in the country. I mean, you probably know better than me. We talked about this yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> was, it's a great market. Yeah. Yeah. So there's always something and don't make it emotional. Just find a market that fits your budget and buy there. There's nothing wrong with with pivoting. Yeah. Markets are always changing. When we listen to this five years from now, the conversations we're having now are going to look totally different five years from now. One thing I want to point out that I think needs to be said, and I feel like this is a great place to say it, okay. is there's a lot of noise out there in, in on social media. A lot of people talking about how successful they are, what they did. Keep in mind that a lot of people that are very successful and talking about how much money they're making, they bought in a different time than you're buying. The buying landscape is not always the same. Um, And so if you're trying to duplicate a strategy that someone else told you works for them, you need to also find out what was their... um, what was the environment like when they bought? What were interest rates at? What kind of saturation was in that market at the time? What price did they pay for the house? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked. It's like I tell people, you can't compare your situation to anyone's. And it's great to have mentors and listen to people, but be realistic about um, the difference between the environment that you're buying in today versus the environment that they bought in, um, and what your, um, you know, what your buying power is today versus then. It changes. And you don't, like Avery said, you don't have to be embarrassed of that. I've gotten priced out of almost every single market that I'd love to invest in today, but I know I can't go in and buy the top product. So the whole reason we build the kind of tools we do is to uncover the new opportunities. And 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 we believe fully, and I've always said this, there is opportunity in every economic climate. Every single one of them is a chance to win if you pivot. If you don't pivot and you're still trying to duplicate strategies from five years ago, you're just going to be set in your way. You're 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 not going to win. Like you're not going to you're not going to win at this. So always be willing to pivot. Don't ever be embarrassed of your budget. It's for all of us. Things are changing. Um, and and just try to be careful who you listen to and understand it and ask the right questions before you compare that scenario to yours. Yeah. And you can always take the principles of someone else's story and apply it to yours, maybe in a different market. Cause you're always going to be able to find if you don't want to buy, like if deep down you do not want to buy, you're always going to be able to find a reason to buy. But if deep down you really do want to take that next step and become an investor or grow your portfolio or buy your next one or buy your first one, a lot of times it's just a pivoting markets like we've talked about. There's always going to be something that works out there. Um, You know, even in 2008, there were several million deals done. It worked for somebody. You'll always be able to find something. You just have to do the work to find the thing. Yeah. And have the right team around you. So I think that's the biggest thing is is that if you have the right team around you, if you understand what you're looking at in data, and I think that's how we started this call to come full circle. If you understand (laughs) what you're looking at in a data set um, to begin with, you're probably, and you know how to manage your expectations um, you're probably not going to end up down this rabbit hole to begin with. Cause I think a lot of the rabbit hole starts with people being overwhelmed with data that they don't understand the logistics behind it. Um, that's just my opinion, but I, I truly have seen that over and over. hundred percent agree. And I think to like tie this all up before we get to the last three questions of the show is don't take any suggestions or 
lists or even like data analyzer tools where you type in the address of something and it spits out what it thinks the income should be. All of those can be a good starting point to find a market or a type of property, but that can't be the only data point that you look at. You have to dig in further and look at the data for the entire market. Find the area in that market that works the best. Don't be trying to buy in Fort Walton proper. You need Okaloosa Island. Same thing in every market. Find where the top producers are. Find um, what they are with the enemy method, find what those things are that make them top producers, whether it's the proximity, amenities, service, all of those things, and then use that tool. Then obviously go find a local agent who is experienced in short-term rentals. I actually made this mistake myself recently. Uh, I was working with an agent in a market that the short-term shop does not operate in. So market that I'm not licensed in, I don't know anybody in, found an agent. And I went under contract on a property that was beautiful and had the best view in the entire in the entire market. And as I started kind of looking and digging around in the data, I realized like this is the best area to live in this market. But all of the higher... Uh, producing properties were in a different area that didn't seem as nice when I went and looked, but they were actually the better properties. And the agent that I was working with just re was really aggressive about like keeping it there. The, it ended up that it needed a $50,000 roof. And at the price I was at, I didn't want to do that. But the agent was really being aggressive about keeping me in that deal because it was the best area to live. And this is a small, small market. So there aren't a whole lot of like I don't know how much better I could have done on the agent front, but um, it really does help to have an agent that understands not just the primary home market, it would have been a great place to live in that market, but the investment, the short-term rental market to understand which proximity it's not. The, the best house to live in is not always the best house to invest in for short-term rentals, even though it can seem like those two things would, would be very similar. And you really have to interview your agent, make sure they specialize in short-term rentals, or at least do enough short-term rental deals to understand the differences in, in those two asset classes, the primary homes and the short terms. And um, just make sure that they're experienced in it, ask a lot of questions, and, and just do your due diligence and all the way from the beginning of the data to hiring your agent, to hiring your lender. Due diligence is key. Yeah. And, and sometimes when you get into those really small, obscure markets, Avery, it's like, Sometimes it's almost impossible to find an agent that has a lot of short-term rental experience. And that's when I think investors have to start to self-advocate and even educate themselves even more. Um, because there's a lot of agents out there that will say yes to anything because they want the sale, but you really have to know how to vet them. And I think that would be a great topic too, to discuss at a different time is like how to make sure you're working with someone who knows what they're doing because, um, there's a lot of people out there that are great salespeople and they can sell anything, especially themselves. So that's a big thing. Um, so yeah, if everyone just does everything that you talked about today, I think they're going to be on a good track. Yeah, I think so too. So thank you so much because I think that you shed a lot of light on what you need to look for in data when you're looking. Cause I think a lot of people are just like, Oh, cool. Four bedrooms do a hundred thousand. Great. But you know, there's things you need to look for. Like does do all the data points have that trailing 12, things like that. But we're coming to the last three questions of the show that we ask everyone who comes on the show. First question is, what advice would you give 20-year-old Erica? Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I don't even, oh, I wasn't prepared for that. There's so much, <laughs> probably from a real estate perspective, um, it would be to um, basically find a mentor sooner. I got into real estate when I was 18, and I did have a mentor for a little bit. But I was kind of independent and thought I could do it on my own. I feel like I would have made a lot more progress if I got a mentor sooner, especially um, on the commercial side. I did eventually do it, but should have done it sooner. Also, be prepared for the collapse that happened. That was a big one. I didn't save enough money. Um, I was really young. When the collapse happened, I was like 23, I think, or 22. I was super young. And I was making a bunch of money in real estate, but not saving or investing it as most people should. So always create um, that secondary revenue stream in your life with real estate income. Totally agree with that. Yep. And, um, you know, something interesting that I found that totally off topic. So everybody's like, I'm waiting for this crash. I'm waiting for this crash. I saw an interesting statistic and unfortunately I can't quote it, but I'll put it in the show notes. I'll find where it was and put it in the show notes. 
that we're already, it's already crashed, guys. The housing market has crashed. You might not have felt it because you still have a job and money and it's not like 2008 was, but less houses have been sold in 2023 than in 2008. So we crashed. It's yep. done. It's so as good as it's getting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I guess it could always get worse, but now it looks like the rhetoric around interest rates is is kind of loosening and they're talking about dropping them. I mean, who the hell knows? I, I certainly do not. I'm not going to pretend like I do, but there appears to be a light at the end of the tunnel. But I did want to point that out. I found that really interesting that less homes sold in 2023 than 2008. We did it. We crashed. Here we are, guys. Here. <laughs> yeah. And real quick on that, though, like when interest rates do go down, that's when everyone starts fighting over houses again and prices go back up. So it's kind of like it's kind of like, well, pick your poison. Like, do you want to buy now when prices have been? I don't even think they're down that much, but they're down. I've seen more movement, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and buy that rate, have the seller buy the rate down and refinance later. Or do you want to wait for rates to drop and then start fighting with people over houses again? I mean, so it's kind of like which landscape do you want to buy in? I, I don't understand people not buying right now. I'm personally still buying right now because I can buy a rate down um, and then refinance later. So hopefully, because I, I don't want to do it when rates drop because everyone's going to be trying to buy the same houses and then people will get more for their house. Yeah. And who, I mean, who knows if that'll happen? First half of 24, second half. Certainly don't want to like come at you guys with a place from a place of like FOMO buying, but yeah. it's you have to do what's right for you. But you can get better deals on the purchase price of properties now than you probably will be able to once rates get back to a manageable level to where people jump in and off the sidelines and start buying a lot again. Yeah, yeah. So keep that in mind. (laughs) And which segues into my next of the three questions. What advice do you have for a new investor who's looking to get started today? I think we've given a lot of advice surrounding that over over the course of the entire episode, but do you have Mm -hmm. anything specific? Oh my gosh, just finding the right mentor. The right mentor that doesn't, like you said, FOMO or... The right mentor that um, has is it basically their life looks like what you would want yours to look like, and you know you follow those people, and you have to always validate your mentors too. Make sure that you're actually following people that are doing what they say they're doing, because there's a lot of people that um, they buy a short term rental, they own one or two, and then all of a sudden they're a coach. I've seen that there's there's hundreds of them popping up, and I'm not putting anyone down for sharing knowledge, but if you're going to ask me to pay to learn from you, I need to know that you have years and years of experience behind that, that you've done um, millions of dollars in transactions, uh, that you've you've built, you know, portfolios, like that's kind of the, the qualifying questions there. And, um, and making sure that their methods are actually, um, their methods aren't just like leaving things out on the table. Like some people's methods just address gross income and we never talk about expenses or things like that. So just be careful, you know, but get a mentor. Um, that would be the very first thing. Don't try to do it yourself because there's so much information. You're going to get on an information overload. Great advice. Uh, Even your real estate agent, Avery, sorry. Even your real estate agent could be your mentor. Like a really great agent could be a mentor. That is true. Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, anybody that you're paying for coaching, obviously you want to look at their track record, make sure that they are where you want to be. And if the answer to that is yes, then great. Move ahead. Yeah. All right. Last question. What's your favorite book? that's impacted your mindset. Can I just be cliche about this? Because I have so many favorite books, but the first one I read that changed my life was Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was 18. And it, the reason I say it's my favorite is I, there's so many other great books out there, like the art of war and all these other books, but Rich Dad, Poor Dad changed my whole perspective on how my future was going to look. It's the reason I got into real estate. It's the reason that, you know, I started working with investment properties that book forever will be a great book for anyone that has no understanding of um, real estate. And I'm talking to a lot of the the younger generation that's listening to go read that book if you haven't. I got it for my daughter when she was like 14. I got the kids version of it for her. Oh, and I, I feel like, things. yeah, I feel like everybody should gift that to their kids. Um, and if you haven't read it, even if you're really experienced in real estate, just read it. It's, it's such a great book and um, it changes your mindset to a lot of things. Yeah, somebody gave me that book when I was 18 and bartending in college, and I didn't read it because I was like, I already know about personal finance. I listen to Dave Ramsey. And (laughs) I didn't actually read it until I got into real estate investing when I was 25. Nice. And I wonder, probably nothing would have happened because you couldn't tell me anything when I was 18 anyway. But uh, sometimes I'm like, would I have smartened up then? Because back then, all my... uh, bartender counterparts that were older than me were buying like 70, $80,000 a, 
$80,000 houses on the east side of Austin that are now million dollar houses. Wow. Yeah, that was, that was dumb. If only we could go, if only we could build a time machine. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, Erica, thank you so much for coming on and spending your time with us and teaching us about you know, data, best practices, when you're looking at data, what to look for. And if our listeners want to follow you, how can they do that? Um, I think the best way, well, of course they can follow me on social media, Erica Muller. We're on Instagram, Vrolio. We're not, we don't have a huge social media presence. Um, but I think the best way, like if they want to connect with us as a company for data, they'd have to go through you. Um, so reach out to Avery if you want to get access to the kind of data we have, because Avery can unlock that for you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Erica, for coming really, really informational, good information. And, uh, we'll have to have you on again sometime. I've got a lot of topics I want to cover related to this. That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks. 